Well, thank you everybody for joining. Um, we got a special treat today. Uh, Dr. Hunter Wilkerson and Annie Marshall, two of the UAB MedPeds physicians, are going to kind of help us through a case. Andy's going to talk a little bit about MedPeds presence on Unremarkable Labs moving forward. And then after that, Hunter's going to take it away and walk us through a case with Dr. Centaur <clears throat> discussing and moderating. And hopefully, someone else, a brave member of the audience, uh, helping him work through it. So, with that, Andy, you want to talk a little bit about uh, MedPeds and Unremarkable Labs? Yeah, absolutely. Thank you, Sal. So as you said, I'm Andy Marshall. I'm a recent MedPeds grad and the current uh, CRQS, the VA in Birmingham. Um, you may have noticed that this is going to be our second uh, MedPeds-ish uh, kind of segment on Unremarkable Labs. The last time we had uh, the assistance of a very qualified discussant, um, but this time we're taking the, the training wheels off, so to speak. And so we're kind of going full bore with it. And so we, we've recently started a, a transition of care clinic to kind of help some of our pediatric patients transition to adult care providers at UAB. And it's something that's going really well, but it's also introducing a lot of patients with classically pediatric problems to adult providers. And so something we've encountered a couple of times um, is patients, you know, being cared for by providers who don't necessarily see the problems they have or know kind of how to work through some of the things they've had since, since their birth and are, are thought of as congenital or childhood problems. And so the purpose of this is to introduce some of these cases, some of these presentations, um, and talk about things from a uniquely MedPeds perspective and hopefully uh, help everyone out so that the next time they're in one of these case scenarios, um, they can be a little bit better prepared to take care of those patients and to know what's going on. So, and with that, I'll kind of segue into letting Hunter take it away and uh, start talking about the case. All right. Um, Sal, how much of the initial history do you want um, at the onset? So it sounds like before we get started, we got Drew on the chat and he is going to help work through this case with Dr. Centaur. And I'm just going to open it up. Anybody else on the call want to work with Drew? Uh, and I, so and I see of, Dr. Garber uh, Brown's on as well. So, yeah, well, one, one wow. of the things we do regularly now is uh, we're going to encourage uh, all the people who do want to talk to at least put ideas in the chat and we'll, we'll respond to those ideas. So we don't, you know, Drew likes to talk, but a lot of people don't like to talk. Uh, so for the, for the people who'd rather not uh, uh, be on the, on mic, please put stuff in the chat for the discussion. Great. Hi, Channing. Go ahead, Hunter. Okay. Um, 20-year-old male who comes into the ER with seizure-like activity. Um, kind of brief past medical history is spina bifida with um, neurogenic bilateral bowel um, paraplegia and then obstructive hydrocephalus with a VP shunt. So okay, so, there. so Drew, since you like to talk, we're going to let you talk a lot. Oh boy. So, um, yeah, this, this is a, I, I, I guess this is an interesting little thing because uh, when we, uh, you know, when we see someone who has, uh, you know, congenital neuro stuff, we typically think, oh, do they have, have they had like a diagnosed seizure disorder before? Um and given the fact that he's had an obstructive hydrocephalus, he's had, you know, Chiari malformation and spina bifida, that probably runs high up on my list. Um, although he's probably gotten care from a pediatric neurologist for that. Um, well, let's, let's, I'm, I'm going to, what I'm going to do is I'm going to reflect a little bit on, mm -hmm. on what you're saying. So the, you're asking exactly the right first question. Is, is this someone who has a seizure disorder, is on medications or, or not taking his medications and now has a seizure? Or is this someone who has a lot of other neurological problems and for the first time is showing up with a seizure? And those lead to different differential diagnoses. And so, uh, and, and this, is not a, this is not a criticism of Hunter, he just said there was seizure-like activity. And mm -hmm. so you're trying, to, you're trying to get more history. And that is very laudable. You always have to get more history because we don't know anything. When you tell me a 20-year-old man, whether he has this past medical history or not, comes in with seizure-like activity, 
first of all, I don't know what kind of seizure-like activity, that, that sounds very nonspecific to me, and I don't know if it's new or old. So we don't know anything right now other than he does have a lot of, uh, a lot of uh, unfortunate history. And, and you got right to the point right away, and I really like that. Mm -hmm. and, 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 ju and to sort of go off of that, um, you know, if, if, this, if, this is a di if this patient does have a diagnosed seizure disorder, he's on medication for it, and he's having seizures, now we need to know why he's having seizures. Is he not taking his medication? Is he having breakthrough seizures, even though he is taking his medication? And why would that be happening? Or does he not have a diagnosed seizure disorder? Is he not on any, any anti-epileptics? And is this, and then we go down a completely different route of, is this um, seizure activity? We, it, we I, I sort of think of it almost in the bucket of the acute, a little bit of the acute altered mental status um, uh, schema for, um, uh, with the whole misto mnemonic. Uh, metabolic issues, infection, structural issues, which this patient has a whole bunch, um, and toxins, um, and, and sort of focusing on the metabolic, infectious, and toxic causes before trying to, and making sure that those, um, those are thought about before blaming everything on the structural causes. So, and, um, and, and I guess another thing too, um, Hunter, uh, did we get a video of, of this seizure-like activity? Because that'll also help as well. Yeah, so Ch yeah. Chioma, Ch Chioma uh, continues uh, our discussion very nicely uh, saying, uh, can we describe the seizure? And uh, we want to know if it's the same or different. So we need more history. Uh, this, this is a this is an interesting chief complaint, but like in many things in medicine, we need more history. So please, Hunter, tell us more. Yes, I very quickly got to the point that I left a lot out. Um, he does have a diagnosis of epilepsy. It is what, well, was well controlled on um, monotherapy with trileptal um, arscob oxcarbazepine. And so um, he's been on a stable dose of that and really has not had seizures in the past six years or so. Um, and so describing the seizure itself, um, it was a one minute and his mom described it as generalized tonic clonic activity that had an associated DSAT needing oxygen then spontaneously resolved. Great. And, and it's unusual for him to have a fever. And so he, the fever would be new for him. And so actually he was seen in clinic um, with Dr. Stein a couple of days earlier, and she had sent off some screening labs and sent off a urinalysis because he has chronic urinary tract infections. Mm -hmm. uh, so, the, so he, so uh, you had you had sent off some labs on him for the fever, and then he shows up in, in the emergency department with a seizure. Status he, post seizure. He had already had the seizure at that point. He'd already had the seizure and labs had been sent. Mm -hmm. Yes, sir. Okay. So what, did they what, use any medication to abort the seizure or did it stop on its own? Spontaneous result. Okay. And uh, so, so Drew, this is a good time to think of what are the questions you would ask at this point? The, the, I mean, the, I mean, for me, like I'd go down the whole trying to rule because he's had a fever i'm now thinking this looks to me more like the infectious bucket that we need that we absolutely need to rule out so things like uh recent sick contacts i see that he um had an, uh, an icu admission um early on for covid uh for covid um did he get vaccinated afterwards um has he had any sort of cough um any other upper respiratory tract symptoms like nasal congestion, um, ear pain or ear tugging. Um, that a, a classic kid question, but especially in a patient who's, um, uh, you know, for someone, for someone like this, an ear infection could easily be missed. Um, if you don't, if you don't ask about ear tugging, um, things like, um, chest pain, look, basically looking for, uh, uh, look, trying to look for a focus and other things like abdominal pain or anything like that. 
I want to rule out upper, up, upper airway infections, and that includes ear, pneumonias, and other lower respiratory tract infections, abdominal infections, which this patient could conceivably have. Um, so things like not asking about nausea, vomiting, diarrhea, constipation, um, and belly pain, uh, and he, um, hemodiesis and melanin and hematochesia. Um, and we did, and this patient does have a history of chronic, uh, chronic urinary tract infections. So making sure that we get that, you know, we go straight to the point and get it and get a UA um, to see if he has any pyuria. Um, so and then again, so and again, just looking for like any other like ulcers or sores or anything like that. What about his, what about his past medical history um, could, could be something we'd have to be concerned about, I think. And then, and then you can tell me if I'm wrong. I mean, the thing is, is that there have been described cases. He did, he did have that one week in the ICU with COVID. Um, and in kids, particularly around the ages of like five, to like around, like older childhood to like early teenage years, um, there's the phenomenon of post-COVID um, MISC. And there have been some described cases of that symptomatology in adults. So that might be something that we have to think about. Are you worried about- Are you, are you worried getting about at, the, are you getting I'm getting at, at the, the, or Some of the other structural abnormalities he yeah. has that might predispose him to seizures. Yeah, I was worried about the VP shunt. Like, well, shunt oh, right, shunt yeah. Right. Yeah, a shunt, yeah, a, a shunt infection definitely infected. In I mean, yeah. I, I don't take care of a lot of people with VP shunts, but the once or twice I've had some adults uh, who actually had serious infections there. So mm -hmm. from, my, from my understanding, working with neurosurgery on the pediatric side more frequently with shunted patients, uh, patients with shunted hydrocephalus, um, seizures are not a typical presentation of shunt malfunction. It's more typical to have vomiting, um, headaches, irritability, um, altered mental status. But there certainly have been cases in any time that I have a patient who has any new neurologic symptom and they have a shunt, I want the shunt evaluated, at least with a shunt series and mm -hmm. um, neurosurgery to weigh in. Yeah, to 100%. Kind of follow up on a what Channing was saying. I always think about shunts when I see it in, in the differential is shunt infection versus shunt malfunction. She described shunt malfunction very, very well. Um, shunt infection typically doesn't happen unless it's within um, the first six months after placement is kind of the, the, the time frame that we typically see that. Um, and that can be related with seizures. Um, but usually after they get outside of that six window for, for the shunt itself, including the catheter and the actual shunt, which is external uh, outside of the skull, you don't typically see that get infected outside of that time frame. Okay. Let's, let's, um, uh, we've gotten, we've gotten a good history of view systems. Um, uh, we had, we had the excellent question that Drew mentioned and Miranda mentioned, and that is, was he exposed to anybody who was sick? So um, does he get exposed to a lot of other people or is uh, just family? Uh, and could he, could he have gotten an infection from someone else? Um, and so mostly just exposed to family. And so kind of his, his baseline, he lives with his mom. Um, and he's able to put on shirts, have conversations, plays video mm -hmm. games. Um, but, but his social circle is not wide enough that I would not, I would be concerned about him, you know, going to school and catching something, going to, I don't know, the St. Paddy's Day Parade or something and catching something. And so he is really just around his family and doesn't have any sick contacts he has. Of. Okay. Okay. So I think it's time to examine him and see if we get any clues from the exam. Yes. And so um, on exam, he is um, uh, obese African-American male. Um, he is sitting in his wheelchair, alert oriented, but non-toxic appearing. Um, normal HENT exam. Um, he was not pulling his ears or didn't have any um, concerns there. Um, respiratory exam, it was, um, as you would expect, limited by body habitus, but no foc focality, no crackles, um, no um, coarse breath sounds appreciated on that. Um, he had a normal rate, regular rhythm heart exam, a little bit lower extremity edema that was bilateral and symmetric. 
on GI exam, it was um, soft, non-tender, um, non-distended, and then um, no musculoskeletal tenderness. Um, for neuro exam, he was um, had normal strength and sensation from about um, mid thoracic area up, and then from there down um, had diminished sensation and um, deficits in his muscular strength. Is this consistent with his previous neurological exam? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. That's his baseline. Okay. And, and this rash, is this rash new? Uh, not necessarily. He's got some, he's got a chronic rash, um, but no, no new areas that would be concerning for cellulitis or any um, open pressure sores or anything. So uh, Drew, is, is there anything in this exam that helps you? I mean, I think the, I, I correct me if I'm wrong, but um, usually in, in spina bifida, I would, ex, I would expect his DTRs to be a bit more active than what's described here. Um, and so his, so his lower extremities at baseline are basically just like uh, one, maybe like one out of five at the most, maybe in terms of strength. Yeah. Okay. One, zero. Zero. Okay. So, yeah. At this point, the exam's not really telling me all that much, with the exception of maybe his respiratory exam. But again, that those diminished breath sounds could just be because of his uh, could just be because of his body habitus. Um, the rash may be something to think about but if that's been going on for a little while then i again you know as dr as dr santor said that i wouldn't think maybe i wouldn't necessarily think like a cellulitis or anything like that um hmm. well this is unremarkable labs so yeah i need labs i have, I have a feeling that that, that something's going to show up in the labs can mm -hmm. i uh, can i drop a pearl on his neural exam before i go dr centaur uh, well, uh, since since I'm clueless, please teach me. Yeah. So, Drew, you're absolutely right. You'd expect some degree of like hyperreflexia or spasticity, um, unless this is a case where this is a myelomeningocele that was repaired in the setting of a tethered cord. And mm -hmm. so there is an association there depending on the level of the defect. Um, and what happens is basically with the myelomeningocele, you have protrusion of their um, spinal cord, right? And so... Mm -hmm that causes a stretch effect, which basically can affect some of the innervation. And I'm not gonna get a full neurologist on kind of how that happens, but you can get hyporeflexia and flaccid DTRs that happen in these chronic um, patients with myelomeningocele, even after repair, um, because of the association with tethered cord. And so I bet if we looked at imaging on this guy of his lumbar spine, that's something that we would see as well. Mm-hmm. You totally lost. And, I mean, me this and, and and this does not look like a picture of like a flaw la Juanine syndrome or anything like that. Which um, oof, there there's a um there's a CP solvers case that I presented on that um on that a while ago. But um yeah no the yeah again this this exam just does not does not screen any focality to me. So okay, let's so. Metabolic is always a possibility, so maybe there's something in the labs that'll surprise us. There are some good labs. Um, I had a feeling, you know, I, the one thing about unremarkable labs is usually they present some labs. <laughs> That's it. So um, day of presentation um, to the emergency department, um, sodium 140, potassium 4.2, chloride 107, uh, a bicarb a little low at 20, Gap of 13, glucose of 100, BUN of 42, creatinine of 1.9, magnesium 1 1.6, uh, calcium of 6.4, and an ICAL of 0 0.73, a FOS of 5.7. Um, he had a white count of 12, hemoglobin a little over 8.5, and, and then platelets of 478. Okay, well, this gives the this gives me something to talk about at least because I, so far the stuff you're talking about, I'm, I'm, I'm really worthless and, and, and not, not embarrassed to admit at all that I know nothing about what you were talking about. 
Um, so, uh, Drew, do you want to do, do you want to tell us what what these labs say to you? Non-gap metabolic acidosis. Or, uh, or, or, hmm. yeah, this is one of my pet peeves, Drew. So you're gonna. Oh you're, right, yeah, because we because we don't have a pH on them, do we? Right, we don't have a VBG, so this could be compensation for respiratory. Oh outputs. yeah, compensation, yeah, for respiratory. Oh right, yeah. You because, don't know, because you he's don't got... know unless you have a VBG. Exactly. Right. We also the other first, things, first mistake that yeah yeah classic and mistake. The other things we don't know that this is not an increased anion gap because we don't know what his nutrition is, and they didn't tell us his albumin. Oh yeah, and so the other thing an albumin too, of, if he has an albumin of two, then this is an increased anion gap. Then acidosis. that would be yeah that would be yeah that would be a gap acidosis. Okay. Um, so so I'm I'm being obnoxious uh, <laughs> as usual, but uh, the point is is to not not to just jump and premature closure on oh it's a gap of only 13 and the bicarb's 20 we have a normal gap acidosis i'm not sure we don't know yet and mm -hmm. so we need to keep our minds open uh with that okay right. what else what else has you excited here um the fact that you guys use iCal and i'm still not used to it since up at um since up at MCV, where I did my uh, the vast majority of my training, they still do not get iCal's up there. Um, I mean, hell, they don't even get procalcitonins, even though that's been in the guidelines for um, uh, at least for like neat, like for um, neonatal what, what, fevers for a while. What is so, iCal? Teach, teach me what iCal is. So the so ionized calcium. So oh, ionized back calcium. In, yeah. yeah, back at, back in the day back in the days when you didn't have those. Um, that would be another thing that you'd use the albumin to correct. If you had a right. if you had a calcium of uh, so this so this calcium is six point four. You since um, since uh, albumin binds calcium, you'd use that albumin in order to basically get a corrected calcium. Right. Uh, depending depending upon whether or not there's some uh, metabolic derangements or anything like that. Yeah, I did. I didn't know the slang iCal. Ah. I just I just knew ionized calcium. I didn't know that it had a cool name. <laughs> so and yeah. now I know. So uh, and what is normal magnesium? Uh, so the, the magnesium's in red. I think that's I think that's low, right? That's low. You usually want it at like two or higher. Okay. So why would this guy have a low? magnesium and a low calcium and could either of those explain the seizure-like activity they definitely could okay so then we're gonna have to think about that what else is remarkable in these labs they're not unremarkable at all mm -hmm. his yeah his creatinine's jumped about four uh about four tenths um, of a mig per dl um, above his baseline. I'm not gonna. I'm not gonna speculate as to why. Um, so why do you his, think he has such a large baseline creatinine? Chronic UTIs and that's damaged his kidneys. He's probably had chronic hydronephrosis for a little while. Probably chronic hydronephrosis. Uh, mm -hmm. So we're, we're probably gonna look at that. Um, mm -hmm. It does it you did it's not mentioned in the GU exam because there's no GU exam mentioned here. And Ooh, so does he have <laughs> does he have a super pubic? Uh does he have does he have a foley? Does it do they do straight casts? How do they handle the neurogenic bladder? Right, so, yeah. That is a great question. So he is um he has opted to not do chronic intermittent capping and so just overflows into a diaper. Just overflows, so that means that he's probably going to have. Uh, oh, he's he's bound to have hydronephrosis. <laughs> yeah, he's going to have he's going to have hydronephrosis. What do you think of his B one to creatinine ratio? Let me calculate that real quick. It's, it's a big number. Uh, above twenty. 
Yeah. So, uh, I mean, normally, and, and of course, the classic around thing you one, think of one nine, we'd have a we'd have a BUN of around twenty. Mm -hmm. Normally, so that that's something for us to worry about. It would. Mm -hmm. I'd love to have an albumin. Why do people get hypomagnesemic? Usually nutritional. Right. But. So this is the time that we we might want to get a nutritional history. Exactly. What? Why else do they get hypomagnesemic? It could be so something that, he, something that he's not on. That so there's the drug he's not on, and I think this is true both in kids and adults. What what very commonly used drug class? Uh, gives hype, can give hypomagnesemia and hypocalcemia. Loops. Uh, you could get it from a loop, uh, but what I'm thinking about is PPIs. Oh, right. So, and it's certainly possible. I'd go back and ask if he's taking anything over the counter. Maybe he gets heartburn uh, with a. BMI of 45, and maybe his mom uh, gives gives him that. I guess the other question, uh, it's interesting that that usually with hypomagnesium and hypocalcemia, you also have hypokalemia. Which this kid does, or, well. He, he, he does not. But remember mm -hmm. that obstructive uropathy uh, can, uh, uh, when we when we discussed a case with uh, Joel Toff recently, it's sort of sort of like a type four RTA. Although he says it's not really a type four RTA, but you can get hyperkalemia, and so this might be relative hyperkalemia because of that reason. Mm -hmm. uh, the phosphate was interesting. So, what does the phosphate being elevated suggest to you? I don't. Did we get a phosphate on him? I think I heard it, didn't I, Hunter? We did. So the FOS on him was, if I can find it real fast, 5.7, so on the half side. And I guess Dr. Estrada had asked um, that they had ordered just a part of the routine, um, routine like renal function panel, um, BMP, whenever he had come, come to clinic or come to the ER. Sorry. So, so normally there are three bedside uh, signs of, of hypocalcemia. Um, so I'm gonna give everyone in the, uh, the chat, uh, especially our scared to speak people, uh, what, what are the bedside tests for clinically significant hypocalcemia? I'll wait for the chat to speak before I say anything. Good. Well, let's, let's see if. Uh, so, uh, what about the reflexes, Miranda? So, but he's hyperreflexic anyway. So, and that's fairly nonspecific. These these are a little bit more specific for hypocalcemia, although they can also occur with hypomagnesemia. Two. Two classic physical findings and one thing else that you do at the bedside. <laughs> you don't have to pronounce the physical exam maneuvers correctly. You can just say what they are. You don't have to use the eponyms necessarily. Because I know Schwastek is the, is the one that I remember. Okay, so which one is Schwastek's? I believe it's the... One, one of them, I don't know if it's if it's either uh, Schwastek or, or Trousseau. I think Schwastek is you tap the, um, uh, trying to remember which nerve on the face it is, and then you get essentially, you essentially get like muscle spasms. Yeah, I, um, think, it's the facial, I think it's the facial nerve. Yeah, facial, yeah. So that's Schwastek's. What is Trousseau? So Miranda gets, thank you, Miranda. Uh, so Trousseau's, what is Trousseau's? Rousseau's, I believe, is, um, goodness, now I'm trying to remember exactly what maneuver you would do to demonstrate it. 
Okay. So you re are you ready to learn? Mm -hmm. Are you ready to learn? So, oh, um, yeah. So uh, you put a blood pressure cuff on uh, between systolic and diastolic. And uh, your, if, 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 if my picture's up there, your, your hand, is, they call it carpopedal spasm, which is an incorrect term, but you, you sort of get uh, this, this thing of your hand going like this. Hypocalcemia will do it. Hypomagnesemia will do it. And there's something else that'll do it. What is the third thing that'll cause a positive trousseau's? And sometimes you get it without the blood pressure cuff in a positive, um, you get a positive trousseau sign without a blood pressure cuff, cuff. And this is very, very important in adolescent medicine. Oh, is it hypophos? Hyperventilation. Oh, hyperventilation. Oh, right. Because, because then you get decreased ionized calcium. Oh, huh. And so, so uh, a, 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 a great emergency department tip if uh, a young patient comes in and seems very anxious and you can't really, sometimes we're not really good at, at finding hyperventilation uh, and you see the hand start going like that, you know, you have hyperventilation. Then you just, then you just have to figure out is the hypoventilation uh, from the anxiety or are they hyperventilating because they're hypoxic? And so uh, this happened to you, Hunter. Didn't pass out though. You didn't pass out. Uh, that that's better than uh, when my when my daughter got married. Uh, my son-in-law's half brother, uh, who was thirteen at the time, uh, uh, we're Jewish, and so we're, we're standing under the chuppah, and, and and during the ceremony, he and he goes down in the in the middle of the ceremony because he didn't listen to what we said ahead of time. Woof. He he locked his knees. I him not like the knees. <laughs> he locked the knees uh, right in the middle of the ceremony. It's, and we've been talking about it ever since. He's about to get married, and I'm going to bring it up if I get to go to the rehearsal dinner. Okay, so... And, and, so, and, and, and that's the other thing, too, is, is that his boss is pretty damn high. So why like, would that be? He, why would that well, be? Because, because of his kidneys. It's not, they're not clear enough. Or the, so so it, this looks like mineral. So, so he probably has uh, significant secondary hyperparathyroidism, mm -hmm. uh, and he may have vitamin D deficiencies. Uh, but he has major uh, mineral metabolism problems leading mm -hmm. to this, and this could. You know, it, I love the way Hunter said it. He said seizure-like activity. So we don't know for sure that it was actually a seizure. Although mom said it was a generalized convulsion, I'd go back and ask her to define it a little bit better. And was it different than before? Mm -hmm. So I want to know, it, does, is there a kidney disease on top of his um, obstructive uropathy? Or is this just his obstructive uropathy is worse? And so probably an ultrasound of his kidneys, but a urinalysis is always a good idea in this situation. Um, this guy's had a lot of bad luck. So maybe he has more bad luck and has a glomerulonephritis or nephrotic syndrome or something like that. And I'd want to mm -hmm. know that uh, before uh, I did anything else. But I, I oh, the, other, the third thing, the third thing, uh, if you really want to know whether it's important hypocalcemia, do an EKG and look at the QT interval. <laughs> I said at the bedside, and, and there's no way to get an EKG unless you go to the bedside or have somebody go to the bedside. It was, it's a trick pimp question. <laughs> but, but it's actually important, so I probably would get an EKG on him. I, try to, I find Trousseau is much easier to do than Shvastics. Uh, probably neurologists are better Shvastics than me. But, but we really want to know how significant clinically that hypocalcemia is. And if we get a really quick positive trousseau's and we have a long QT, then we're going to have to start thinking about that. And we really have to worry about why his creatinine is elevated. You're right. Could this just be a urinary tract infection? And could this be pyelonephritis? And 
probably be really hard to diagnose pyelonephritis in this young man um, because of his neurological problems. Um, the other thing is because of his uh, because of his obesity and his neurological problems, his renal function is probably much much worse than estimated GFR. So let's talk about that for a second. So, and some of you've heard me say this over and over and over again. Uh, the estimated GFR assumes that the patient has normal muscle mass for their age weight and gender, and some places still use race. Some places uh, have stopped using race, and I think it's appropriate to stop using race for a variety of reasons, and, and I have a whole podcast on that. This guy certainly has decreased muscle mass because of his neurological symptoms. So his renal function is much worse than another 20-year-old with a creatinine of 1.9. And we really can't use estimated GFR to know how severe he is. I'm going to guess he's at least stage 3B, if not stage 4 chronic kidney disease, because he has anemia and he has hypocalcium and hyperphosphatemia. And if, in fact, he has a normal gap acidosis, that also probably is due to his kidney disease. And the question is, is this is this acute on chronic or just progression of his chronic kidney disease? So this, this is actually very confusing for most of us most of the time because we just look at the estimated GFR and we believe that number. Uh, but in thinking about this guy, and, and uh, since I work at the VA, I don't see patients like this, but I see cord injury patients. And cord injury patients will have very, very funny estimated GFRs. We had a patient in our service uh, last week had an estimated GFR of 250. <laughs> it doesn't go up above 120. And that's because he was very, very cachectic, uh, very much less muscle mass uh, than you would expect. Now, <clears throat> I don't know whether... Uh, I think you can get Cystan C at University Hospital. We can't get it uh, quickly at the VA, but many many nephrologists now think that in situations like this, Cystan C is a much better way to estimate GFR. The other thing you could do is, is collect uh, a 24-hour urine, or you could actually collect a 12-hour urine, some period of time urine to actually calculate a GFR. But I think that's really important in this, in this patient is to understand that the estimated GFR is going to overestimate his GFR. Does that make sense to everybody? Yep. And, 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 and there's also a problem with that 24-hour urine collection as well, because as Hunter mentioned, this patient is not doing chronic intermittent caths, so his bladder is going to be distended and already overfilled. So you've got basically urine from like, God knows how long that's going to be coming out first. So I, I, I guess the question then would be, when would you start the 24 hour clock? Yeah. If, if we were going to, if we we're going to uh, actually get 24 hour urine collection, uh, you temporarily put in a Foley, uh, empty the bag and then, and then uh, start maybe about an hour later after, after you've emptied his bladder. Uh, mm -hmm. just and 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 for the exact logic that you said drew so i'm really I, i'm thinking that uh he that the seizure activity could be metabolic um but he also could have an infection so i really want to say your analysis uh, is it has is the way we're working through this makes sense to everybody and i is this his is this his uh, usual hemoglobin or is, or is it, it, has it gone down or has it stayed about the same hunter? Um, the other labs that we had as far as hemoglobin was a 9.4. And so, so he is anemic, maybe not that anemic, but he does have baseline. And it, has he had a high white count before? Um, no, sir. Okay. So mm -hmm. the, the theory, um, of, recurrent urinary tract infections 
is certainly a reasonable one now. And he easily could have pilo because of the obstruction from his neurogenic bladder. I mean, there's, he could ha just have destruction of his kidney from the, from the, uh, from, from the hydronephrosis. So mm -hmm. sh show us more stuff, Hunter. We're, uh, oh, right. So we're trying of... to figure out what's happening. This poor guy, I feel so badly for him. He um, has, has some other labs, had some imaging too. And so um, to kind of round out his lab work, um, had a parathyroid hormone level of 317. Um, a we, 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 pre we predicted that. Yeah, mm -hmm. got that one right. And the vitamin D of less than seven, a ferritin of 47, um, TSH of uh, a little bit under two. Um, and then for imaging, had a VP shunt series um, that showed um, no discontinuity in um, the shunt itself, no kinking, no um, breaks in it. Um, and then a CT head showed uh, stable ventricles compared to um, an exam last year. Um, got a renal ultrasound that showed similar right-sided moderate hydronephrosis. Um, and then unable to see the left kidney. And then um, for micro studies um, and urinalysis had a spec grab of 1.01, .01, two plus protein, one plus broad two plus leukesterase, greater than 50 whites, and then many bacteria. So, so let's let's talk about the urinalysis because a, a lot of learners take urinalysis for granted and, and don't work through them. And there's actually information there. We've already spent the money, so we might as well get the most we can out of it. Hmm. We're wondering, could this be volume contraction because of the BUN to creatinine ratio? The other reason for the BUN to creatinine ratio is he has so, so, so little muscle mass that the BUN is actually a better measure of his GFR sort of than, than his creatinine because he, has, because he probably has very little muscle mass. If it was volume contraction, he should have an elevated urine-specific gravity. But his urine-specific gravity is the same, probably the same as his serum-specific gravity. Uh, 1.010 is a, it means that it's neither concentrated nor di dilute. If you remember that number, 1010, this is neither concentrated nor dilute. Mm -hmm. So that's very consistent with what happens to you as you get chronic kidney disease. And so I'm very suspicious that we're dealing with significant progression of his kidney disease from the hydronephrosis. Uh, could be that 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 in and of itself is why if if he had a seizure or is this just a response to the calcium, the pH is six point five. It's not really alkalotic, but it's it's as we say in Alabama, it's fixing to be al alkalotic, alkalotic, and I wonder whether he has uh, a uh, protease uh, uh, type uh, bacteria, but we're going to get a culture. Uh, I assume that in between infections that he gets rid of the red cells and the white cells. Um, and this is not just chronic. Um, so I think he needs, I, I think, I think in, and I hate Foley catheters, but he either needs uh, repeated straight casts or Foley catheter uh, to, to relieve this infection uh, and, uh, and, and some kind of antibiotics and I'm going to get renal involved and decide whether or not uh, he really had something. So mm -hmm. uh, any comments on that? Does that all make sense, Drew? Yeah, I, I guess the other thing would be, um, and this actually is an issue when we're doing UAs in, um, in little kids, um, is what was the method by which we got the urine? Um, because if... Uh, if we're just getting the urine just based off of like, you know, he's um, like, it's, it's, you know, the urine that comes out right when you put the Foley in, then you're going to get a whole bunch of epithelial cells. You're going to get a whole bunch of uh, other mess in there. Um, and so essentially the standard for diagnosing a UTI in this patient would be to, you know, get, get a clean, get a clean intermittent cath or a, um, or, ha or have him, uh, or have it be like a, a, a Foley sample after he's been decompressed. 
Yeah. Um, and it's and it's the same and it's the same thing in little kids where you um the typical method that they use to get urine actually is to put essentially cotton balls in the uh, in the in a child's diaper and uh, get the urine out of those. But that that's a whole mess in terms of how you interpret the UA from getting that urine. So you know we have the whole issue of. Yeah. You know, when do you, when do you straight cath when do you straight cath a little kid in order to get a sample to try and diagnose a UTI or um, and, and all that? So Hunter, teach us what what did what is the uh, resolution? How how well did we do? Uh, and what do you want us to have learned from this from this uh, patient? All right, so really. Um caught the main kind of the main points and so they they did treat it as he had a seizure and came in and so um he got a few grams of calcium gluconate got some mag and got rocephin for his urinary tract infection he ended up growing um enterococcus um and so they the people that admitted him thought the seizure was from him being hypocalcemic and um, him having a urinary tract infection and so they discharged him on um Tums or calcium gluconate, or sorry, um, calcium carbonate, um, and then vitamin D, um, and then some macrovid. And did they make any comments about his chronic kidney disease? They did not. And actually, interesting enough, because I thought um, his um, he was followed by nephrology more so for hypertension, um, which I would assume would be from some degree of CKD, but. Um, looking forward to his most recent labs, he actually had a creatinine of 0 0.9. And so I wasn't really sure what to make of this, like 1.5 that he had. Um, but um, mm -hmm. he was being followed by more so for the hypertension, but no comment about the CKD itself. But so it's I going think, down to 0 0.9. Yes, sir. Um, you know, I, he, he does have albuminuria. And so I, I, I would assume that even if his, um, you know, creatinine goes down, he still has a, that's still probably higher than 0.9, like you were saying, in someone else. Um, so I think that, I mean, he has some degree of CKD already, but just maybe not quite as high as we originally thought. When, when his cranning went down, had, had his calcium and magnesium returned to normal? Yes. And so the most recent ones I saw was a um, calcium of eight and a half, albumin of four, um, and iodized calcium of 1.21. And then that was when the creatinine was 0.9. And that so was, he probably had a urinary tract infection for quite some time to get to the point where his PTH went up and his calcium went down. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So I guess and, and, so. oh, and uh, just, just to sort of um, add to Hunter's point about um, nephrology following him for hypertension, in the pediatric guidelines, um, pediatric nephrologists are the ones who, are, who follow uh, who, who follow kids uh, if they develop hypertension less than the age of 18, which is kind of, you know, it's, it's, kind, it's kind of a weird thing, especially from med peds where um, we have experience managing adults with hypertension just as generalists. And so you'd think, you'd think that, you know, in pediatrics, you would be, um, you know, as, as, you know, you start to see more, um, kids who are, uh, who are getting metabolic syndrome, uh, you know, obesity and everything, and hypertension becomes more common, you'd think that general pediatricians would be able to um, manage hypertension more easily, but they still recommend referring to peds nephro if you have, um, if you have a diagnosis of hypertension and leaving the medication management to them. But, but now he's, now he's in the uh, special med peds clinic. And our med peds residents and attendings know 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 a lot about hypertension and should should be able to uh, take care of that. Channing, do you want to make a comment about that? Yeah, I do think it's interesting because, like Drew pointed out, uh, you know, it is a different culture, and that's kind of part of the transition that any of these patients have to go through is going from being managed by a specialist for a chronic condition like hypertension to a primary care doctor in the adult world that could easily uh, manage those issues. Um, I think obviously if there is an underlying renal etiology of the hypertension, which is more common in pediatrics, um, that would be the reason why you'd have a nephrologist involved. Um, but I think we've kind of gone over his underlying reasons for um, 
for having renal disease um, ad nauseum this this podcast. So we've kind of covered most of the most of the points that um, I think there are to teach in terms of all of that. Great. Well, thanks everyone. Uh, Hunter, thanks for a great presentation, and Drew, thanks for uh, putting yourself out there. And uh, thanks, Miranda, for several great comments. And uh, uh, let's see, have a great week. Thanks, Hunter, for a great presentation. Thanks, everybody. Have a good, good one. All. Yeah.